Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution and the World in 2050 series of talks in particular. Uh, this particular talk was recorded in uh, June about the global environmental challenges. Uh, unfortunately, the video was originally cut off at the very beginning, and therefore I am recording this introduction once again. The talk was by uh, Dr. Eliza Lanzi from the OECD in Paris to discuss what we can all do to address and be aware of the global environmental challenges, particularly in relation to pollution. So I hope you enjoy uh, this video and please follow the remaining World in 2050 talks on our YouTube channel, which is the virtual BILSI YouTube channel. I hope you enjoy this talk. Thank you very much. Is that there are uh, competing forces that drive materials use. Um, on the one hand, we have economic growth, which will substantially drive up materials use. On the other hand, uh, we have structural change, which will decrease it. Um, technologies changes that would also uh, help decrease the reliance on material, but overall uh, structural change and technology changes won't be able to offset the large effects of economic growth that drives materials use. So um, overall, we still have that um, a projected increase in materials use over time. Um, What's interesting is also the uh, looking at the difference um, across materials, uh, also because they're linked to different uh, environmental effects. So what we see is that a large amount of uh, materials use corresponds to materials used for construction, uh, so non-metallic minerals. Um, that's uh, just when looking at uh, materials in terms of their weight, uh, not uh, if if we look at environmental um, impacts, because the, the impacts of smaller materials are so, sometimes very negative. And then if we look at the projections, uh, what we see is that there is a substantial increase in all materials, but some of the um, smaller materials, let's say like metals, actually have a very high increase as they're used in a, in a range of sectors. Um, so it, it's, quite interesting to see the differences uh, across materials and also uh, to take into account the large amount of materials that we use in, uh, in our economy. Um, there are also large differences across countries. So again, if we look at OECD countries, because we're going towards growth, but also um, it's a, a more stabilized growth, there's an increase in materials use, but it's uh, less strong than for other groups of countries. So when we look at bricks, for instance, there is a steeper increase, especially um, for, um, for fossil fuels and metals. And then if we look at the rest of the world, meaning including developing countries and other um, emerging economies, the, um, the increases are even more substantial uh, for all materials, but especially metals and non-metallic minerals. Again, this shows the links to uh, construction and uh, building of infrastructure. Um, it's also important when looking at materials to take into account the role of recycling uh, and the extent to which uh, our economies are currently circular and will transition to uh, circularity. Uh, what we find is that, uh, in, according to the projections, uh, recycling will increase a lot more than mining. Uh, while that's an encouraging result, um, it is not quite sufficient to really say that the economy is more circular. And when we look at the projected amounts of um, some specific metals, so iron and steel, for instance, we see that uh, the projections for primary and secondary are fairly similar. And that's because if on one hand there's more recycling, on the other hand, there's a lot more um, amounts of metals that are demanded so that um, overall primary and secondary um, iron and steel, but also other metals grow uh, at the same pace. And also, yeah, recycling remains a very small share. Uh, recycled materials remain, remain a very small share of the economy. So, um, so the levels of circularity are still projected to remain low. Um, 
Now to get to uh, the environmental impacts, uh, one of the main impacts is the emissions of greenhouse gases related to materials. What we have here is that um, we can attribute uh, certain sources of emissions um, to materials use or materials management. And if we look at it, these are basically the majority of emissions and they include agriculture, energy supply and industry. We have that these um, emissions are projected to increase substantially over time. And uh, overall, we have that 12% of total greenhouse gas emissions are associated with the uh, um, key materials, so with materials used. Um, and 12% uh, are associated with um, uh, concrete. And uh, uh, about 50 gigatons of CO2 equivalent emissions are associated with materials used. These might seem like smaller percentages compared to larger sources of emissions, but in the transition towards net zero emissions for uh, climate change, it's really important to take into account uh, all emission sources. And these are some of the emission sources that are quite hard to abase um, and should really be taken into account uh, when developing policies. Um, however, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are not the only uh, environmental impact uh, related to materials use. Uh, and there is actually a large amount of impacts uh, linked to uh, materials from extraction to processing, and then uh, from also related to the end of life um, part of the life cycle. So if we look, for instance, at the materials illustrated in the slide, we have that concrete is uh, clearly linked to climate change through emissions of greenhouse gases, but also causes, for instance, acidification and uh, is related to land use uh, through mining. Um, then we have copper that is linked to eutrophication and uh, um, causes issues with freshwater aquatic to toxicity. Um, iron is linked to pretty much all um, environmental impacts. Uh, and when we look at the projections, we see that these are uh, these issues are projected to um, increase substantially uh, for all materials. So this is uh, one thing to keep in mind because it's not just about uh, uh, mining and the greenhouse gas emissions, but there's also a large range of environmental impacts that are linked to um, materials used and processing. It's also interesting to look at the uh, differentiation between primary and secondary materials. So uh, these are the um, environmental impacts linked to uh, primary copper and nickel. But then when we look at secondary, there are still environmental impacts, but they're much reduced. So overall, uh, moving towards a more circular economy uh, would actually be beneficial, uh, not just for circularity, but also for uh, reducing uh, environmental impacts quite substantially. Now, uh, this first part of the talk provided an, uh, an idea of the link between um, environmental uh, impacts and economic growth. But I'd like to now move to a focus on uh, plastics as an interesting example and um, also uh, because I can more concretely show also what can be done in terms of uh, um, policies to reduce the problem of plastic pollution. So why is uh, plastics an interesting case study? Plastic is a fairly uh, recent material. It was invented in 1862 um, in, in the, uh, the, as Parkinson initially. Um, by the British Alexander Parks. Um, and then just briefly after, <clears throat> there was uh, the invention of bacolite, which um, basically was used as a more solid type of plastics to, <clears throat> to create um, other, um, I mean, uh, different types of uh, products. Um, and uh, for, for instance, sorry, uh, in 1931, Ericsson uh, invented the first uh, telephone made with bacolite. Then <clears throat> by the 1950s, basically, we had entered a culture in which plastics could be used wisely and uh, people were just happy with uh, the uh, throwaway type of approach to consumption and use of plastics. 
And uh, this showed up also in the, in, in the graduate movie, which is quite uh, interesting. And basically, uh, overall, we have that uh, between 1950 and 2019, plastics use increased by 20, uh, 230 times from two megatons in 1950 to 450 in 2019. That's a huge increase for uh, such a new material. And the reason for it is that plastics is actually very, very useful and versatile material, which has lots of, um, which have lots of very useful qualities. The issue, however, is that uh, it has also, um, it causes a big problem of plastic pollution. And while this problem has been uh, ignored for a long while, more recently, it's uh, it's come to attention of policymakers. First of all, this came with a seminal paper by Jamba on marine plastic litter. Um, there was then subsequent work by uh, Geyer uh, to highlight uh, and quantify the plastics use and waste uh, at the global level. And then there's been uh, around 2017, the, um, the Blue Planet documentary with shocking images, which raised substantially public uh, attention. And this has led to policymakers starting to make changes, including the China import ban, but also restrictions to specific single-use products, uh, such as straws and plastic uh, cutlery. Um, <clears throat> so, Overall, there's been recently a strong movement towards trying to address the issue of uh, plastic pollution and a, a really increased ambition to address this project. This showed at the UNIR resolution um, uh, last year, uh, where, um, where there was a mentioning of ending plastic pollution and towards an international legally binding instrument which basically led to the start of the international negotiations. We've recently had the uh, Intergovernmental Negotiation, Negotiating Committee uh, meeting in Paris, um, which is very interesting to host for us. Um, and then the question is basically, how do we deliver on this high global ambition? And the work we've done tries to um, provide some answers. Um, so as for materials overall, we uh, project that global plastics use will increase over time in absence of additional policies. And uh, again, it's interesting to see the breakdown by countries. And here we have that uh, there is a strong increase, especially in several Asian countries, such as uh, China and India, but also in uh, sub-Saharan African countries. Um, and again, this comes with uh, with economic um, growth. It's also interesting to look at the uh, polymer, different polymers, and how they're increased, the increase, and um, how link they're linked to the different sectors and applications. Um, so, if if we look at um, how the different polymers grow we see that they're linked to specific applications. And in particular, we have that about two thirds of all use of plastics is linked to packaging, construction, and uh, uh, vehicles. And if you look more specifically, you can see that packaging really occupies a large amount of uh, plastics production and, um, and using different polymers. And this uh, is of course, one of the main drivers of plastic pollution. Um, with plastic production, of course, also comes plastic waste, which is also uh, projected to increase over time. Um, but most importantly, it's um, it's still problematic, uh, the amount of uh, plastics that is mismanaged, meaning that is uh, has much higher chances to end up in the environment. Despite projected uh, in improvements in waste management, we have that there's still going to be by 2060, about 50% of plastics that will be mismanaged. A large amount of plastics is landfilled and is projected to continue being so. Um, similarly, the, um, the percentages of incinerated plastics um, are, pro are projected to remain uh, fairly constant. Um, and finally, there is projected to be a substantial increase in uh, the amount of recycled plastics, which uh, will basically double by 2060. 
Um, and while that's encouraging, it's still um, fairly small compared to the overall amount of plastic waste produced and also relative to the amount of waste that's still mismanaged. Um, there are two consequences of, um, of plastic um, production and leakage to the environment. There's two types of plastics. One is macroplastics. So it's big uh, chunks of plastics or plastic products that end up in the environment. And the other is microplastics, meaning really small particles that end up, for instance, in oceans or in any case in the environment. And they're much harder to then find and um, eliminate from the environment. What's interesting is that when we look at their links to development, they don't have the same trajectories. So if we look at macroplastic, we have what is referred to as the Kuznets curve, meaning that as countries become more wealthy, they generally tend to reduce a specific environmental issue. So if we look at the link between economic uh, well, wealth, uh, so economic growth and uh, the amount of plastic, macroplastic leakage to the environment, uh, we see that there is a, sort of a decreasing curve. Initially, it increases. So as people become wealthier, they consume more and they use more microplastics, which ends up in the environment. But then as they become wealthier, uh, the amount of macroplastic leakage goes down because uh, there is better waste management and there is uh, um, less littering and so on and so forth. So that's an encouraging result when thinking of the future when we'll be wealthier and therefore um, also better as managing plastics. Um, however, when we look at microplastic leakage, the results are, let's say, less encouraging. And here the reason is because the main uh, drivers of microplastic leakage are um, sources that uh, you don't necessarily address when you become wealthier. For instance, uh, it's, uh, you know, by washing your clothes with certain products, you'll have microplastic leakage, you'll need uh, good sewage systems, which at times are scarce. Um, there is also microplastic links to uh, transport, which does not necessarily decrease as you, um, as you become, as countries become wealthier. Um, so overall, uh, this is just to show that there are very different dynamics and whereas macroplastics um, is maybe easier to address, uh, though of course challenging, microplastics uh, will uh, require a bit more thinking in terms also of how to address the issue. Um, if I may just add, there is also the issue that microplastics uh, is derived from the um, plastics that already exist in the environment. So there is also a problem of uh, the amounts of plastics that are accumulated already and uh, that remain out there in the environment. Um, so uh, there are also other issues uh, besides plastic leakage to the environment um, that are linked to plastics uh, use. Um, so one of course is plastic leakage. Um, then there is the uh, amount of plastics that, that's mismanaged in dam sites and open pit burning, which leads to other types of, um, um, of environmental issues, such as greenhouse gas emissions from the burning, of course. Um, there are, as I mentioned, stocks of plastics in aquatic environments that are still um, consistent. Um, greenhouse gas emissions related to plastic production, um, as it's, uh, of course, fuel-based, but also waste management through especially incineration, but not only. And then there is a large amount of other life cycle impacts similar to the ones I've uh, presented before in materials, which range from land use to human toxicity, but also affecting uh, biodiversity um, and just generally the environment. Um, now, um, there's stuff that we can do to address this issue. And the question is what exactly and what policy packages can bend the plastic curve? So we have um, designed uh, two policy packages um, with the different vision behind. On the one hand, we've looked at a regional action, meaning that we look at the present situation and the current circumstances and policy landscape to also see in terms of projections where we think different regions are hazards. 
Um, and then we try to answer the question on how to achieve better environmental outcomes so that we gradually increase the stringency of measures over time, but taking into account the current situation. So where is the current uh, regionally differentiated action heading, uh, well, leading us to? Then on the other hand, we designed a global ambition scenario in which we start from the end, let's say. We start from the end goal, which is the global goal to eliminate um, leakage uh, of plastics to the environment. Here, the question is, how do we get to this goal? So we designed uh, a coordinated policy action. It's coordinated at global level, so that we uh, need to see how scaling up at global level can actually um, lead to the elimination of plastic pollution. Um, for both packages, we uh, take into account the same set of policies, which address plastics throughout its life cycle. And that's really important because you can't simply address plastic uh, pollution by cleaning up. There's just too much plastics that end up, ends up in the environment. You can't just say, let's recycle because there would still be too much that's mismanaged and ends up in the environment. Um, or let's incinerate more, etc. That also leads to other environmental issues. So it's really necessary to take into account each step and also aim at reducing um, plastics uh, use and um, at um, extending the lifestyle of product, the lifetime of products. Um, so concretely, we designed a, a policy package in three parts. The first one is then to address plastics upfront, let's say, which is restraining plastics demand and enhance circularity. That includes, for instance, plastics taxes, but also eco design instruments. Um, then we aim at enhancing uh, recycling uh, that can be done through um, waste management, but also recycled content targets and extended producer responsibility. And finally, closing leakage pathways, uh, which can be done through improving plastic waste collection and improving litter collection. Now, with, um, with these two policy packages, we... Um, we differentiate basically um, each policy instrument. So I'll just provide a couple of examples to, um, <clears throat> to give you an idea. For regional action, for instance, we differentiate the taxes with the uh, uh, levels that are not the same for uh, the EU, the rest of the OECD, and then um, non-OECD countries. And this reflects the current levels of engagement, which are um, a bit higher in the EU. Um, compared to uh, the rest of the world, even the rest of the OECD. Um, then we have a uh, global ambition where instead we have the same tax levels across the world and also they become higher over time so that by the end of the time period in 2060, they're basically double of uh, what you have in the regional action scenario. So it's expanding in terms of regional coverage, but also uh, more ambitious action. Um, another example is for recycled target content. Uh, we have um, in the regional action uh, differentiated between OECD and non-OECD uh, levels. Um, and uh, in the global ambition, instead, it's the same uh, targets uh, for all countries. Now, given that, these are the results of our uh, projections. Uh, first of all, we have that uh, in the baseline, there is an increase in plastics use and waste um, and a less steep increase in mismanaged plastic waste because we assume that even in baseline there are improvements in um, waste management. Um, and then there's a, a, likewise a less steep increase in plastic leakage. When uh, we take regional action, we see that there is a, a slight um, decrease in plastics use and plastic waste and uh, then a substantial increase, a decrease in mismanaged plastic waste and in plastic um, leakage. Um, and this is because the second part, let's say, of the life cycle, life cycle has more decreased because it has the benefits of the first part of the policy package, but then also the improvements from the enhanced recycling and the closing leakage pathways. Um, when we look at the global action, we see that there's um, more substantial reductions 
Um, although, as you can see, compared to the baseline, the use of plastics and the amount of plastics waste still um, substantially increase over time. But here we are decreasing mismanaged plastics waste and plastics waste and plastic leakage to very, very um, small levels. And um, I'd like to point out that the remaining amounts of plastic leakage to the environment are mostly from microplastics and especially microplastics that is generated from, from macroplastic that's already out in the environment. So these are uh, sources of microplastics that are very um, hard to address. Um, besides addressing plastic um, pollution, this policy package also leads to uh, an increase in, let's say, the circularity of the global economy. So um, in the uh, year 2019, we had that circularity was about 6%, meaning that the share of recycled plastics in the economy was uh, 6%. That's projected to be doubling uh, to reach 12% by 2016, in the baseline scenario, to increase to 29% with regional action and to reach 41% with global ambition. Um, so there's additional benefits besides plastic leakage from, um, from these policy packages. Um, and as I showed often, the um, um, relying more on secondary materials also implies less environmental impacts, not zero environmental impacts, but less. Um, in terms of costs, uh, this, um, these policy packages have um, relatively low uh, impacts on the global economy, but uh, on average, but there are significant regional differences. Um, if we look at the regional action policy package, uh, we see that um, the costs are fairly small uh, for most regions, so below 1% of GDP. With the exception of uh, other EU, which is an interesting case, it's because we've basically assumed that being part of the EU, they reach the same targets as um, other EU countries. But these are the uh, more recent additions to the EU, meaning that the, for instance, waste uh, management system is a little uh, less advanced, so that the cost might end up being a bit higher. Uh, when we look at the um, global ambition uh, scenario, here we see that the costs are a bit higher, but also that there is large differences and there are a few regions for which the costs can be quite high. And this highlights uh, part of the discussions that are currently taking place at the international negotiations on the need for financing for developing countries. Um, and uh, indeed, it will be very difficult to achieve very substantial improvements in waste management uh, practices uh, in in countries in certain countries without um, financial support. Um, now, just to uh, uh, wrap up and show you the differences between uh, two different types of features, there's uh, one in which we're heading. Uh, so it's a baseline scenario where we're heading. Um, towards you know, just carrying on with the current policies, and then a global ambition scenario where we uh, pull forces and address um, globally the issue of plastic pollution. So in the first instance, what you see is that most of uh, the plastics used comes from primary plastics, and only a small flow comes from recycled plastics. In the second instance, you're not only reducing the amount of plastics used overall in the economy, but um, uh, about half of that plastics comes from recycled plastics. Um, when looking at plastics waste, <clears throat> we see that uh, it's much reduced with the global ambition and that a large amount of it goes towards uh, uh, recycling. So with a, a much higher circularity of the economy. And then finally, uh, the fairly substantial amounts of leakage to the environment um, end up to being uh, a lot uh, smaller when uh, we have global ambition. <clears throat> However, uh, there remains a large problem, which is the stocks uh, in rivers and oceans. These are about 140 uh, megatons of plastics in 2019. They're projected to be uh, to reach 493 
uh, in the baseline scenario, and they're projected to be reduced to 300 uh, with global ambition. However, because uh, we're not going to reach immediately the uh, elimination of plastic pollution or the substantial reduction of plastic pollution, uh, th there's the issue that plastics in the meanwhile will continue to accumulate in rivers and oceans, also leading to microplastics. So, um, so this highlights the need to also carry on um, while trying to find ways to clean up um, rivers and oceans. Um, all right, just uh, a few remarks to conclude. Um, what I hope I've showed is that despite structural change and technological change, uh, materials used is, and, and including plastics is projected to increase in absence of ambitious policy action to address environmental issues. Um, and this, uh, without additional policies, will exacerbate a wide range of environmental impacts. Um, while recycling is projected to become more competitive, it is not sufficient to shift the balance between primary and secondary materials use, again, unless we uh, put in place more ambitious policies. And when looking specifically at plastics, uh, we find that eliminating plastic liquid leakage requires global action on all aspects of the plastic life cycle. And finally, to keep in mind is that even if leakage is eliminated, the stops of accumulated plastics in rivers and oceans will still increase, highlighting the need for efforts to tackle cleanup, um, but also uh, enough, like other ranges of environmental issues which can affect biodiversity, uh, but also human health in the coming decades. And with that, I'd like to thank you and um, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Eliza. Uh, please show your appreciation for an excellent presentation. There's so many questions, Eliza. Uh, there's, there's some in the chat room already, but uh, I will also just share the screen again with the Slido because we, we said we're gonna do that again. So bear with me uh, one second. And we need to play that. We need to go back. So don't vote yet. Oops. Okay. So for those of you who want to take part again in the in the thing, so you've got your QR code and slido.com, and then we can do the quiz one more time, the poll to see whether you've changed your mind in terms of the environmental challenges. I'm just going to give people a second to do that. I think it's really important, though, that we can actually uh, have a good discussion around the environment. The one thing that has come uh, as a surprise to me, Eliza, before we get to the Q&A, uh, is that actually plastic use and plastic waste in particular is still going to increase significantly despite regional and, and, and global action. You know, And I think... That is probably something that we need to discuss afterwards. You know, what can we do to reduce plastic use and plastic waste full stop? Because that's further up in the, in the process. If we can do more there, then we stand a better chance. So is everybody now ready on, on uh, Slido? We'll track on with the questions again. So the first one is, let me just move that out of the way. Capitalism and positive environmental change can both thrive together. Okay, we've got nine people so far online. I think this was more equal early on. I think uh, we seem to in getting to, to an area now where we think actually the two cannot be run uh, concurrently. So interesting, that's an interesting change from the previous one and it's getting worse in terms of disagreement. So we'll move swiftly along to the next question. I don't know whether you can see that here or not on the screen. There you go. Uh, to best protect the environment, we need to increase global cooperation regulation, reduce consumption, reduce the global population, and reduce travel. Again, six people so far. I'll give it a couple more minutes for people to, to vote. Okay, so I think it looks 
reduce consumption is something that all of us can do, uh, which is going up and increase global cooperation. Uh, reduce pro global population has gone down a bit, but nobody still thinks that reducing travel <laughs> is the way to solve, solve some of the crisis. So that's an interesting one, which I'm sure we can come to uh, in a bit. And then the final question, by 2050, environmental problems will be better, worse, the same, or who cares, we'll be living on Mars. <laughs> well, interesting to see, oh, that's 11%. So one person is obviously going to live on Mars by 2050. Must be, a, must be a good friend of Elon Musk. That seems to be the only way we're going to be on Mars by, by 2050. Good, well, draw that to a conclusion. Thank you very much, everybody, for, for participating. And we'll, share, we'll do this, share the screen now, which is great. So we now come to the Q&A session. I know you probably found some of the slides quite dense. I've asked Eliza whether she's happy for the slides to be sent out to everybody who came tonight. So if I've got your email address, if you bought your tickets online, you either you're on Zoom or in the room, then uh, we'll send the slides out to you for future reference. Okay, but now we go start with the q and I'm gonna be doing the walking around with the microphone. Who wants to ask the first question in the room? If now there are questions online. Yes, there are questions online as well. Okay, we'll, we'll go to the online audience first. Oh, by the way, online audience, if you want to unmute and show your screen, you can ask the question directly of Eliza if you want to. Otherwise, I'll just read them out from the, from the chat room. Okay, the first question here is, what is the possibility of collecting plastics in the oceans from zones such as the GP2G, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? There's a, huge, there's a huge body of water in the Pacific, which is just littered with plastic. So what can we do to actually, you know, retrieve that plastic and deal with it? So I'm not actually an expert in plastic cleanup, but uh, from what I understand is that there are different possibilities um, to clean up um, plastic from ocean, especially the Great Pacific garbage patch. And uh, however, it's of course costly and it won't immediately solve the problem because there will be more and more plastics that accumulate. One thing I've learned while working on plastics, which is I found surprising, is that uh, the Great Pacific garbage patch is not the most complicated type of plastics to eliminate from the environment. It's actually a lot more difficult when you have, for instance, plastics at the bottom of oceans or lakes, and it's been there for a long while, and it's sort of become part of the um, of the environment of the ecosystem. So that if you take it out, you have of course benefits because then you won't have microplastics but you might actually uh, disturb or endanger certain species. Um, so I just wanted to mention it because I, I thought that was an interesting, uh, you know, it, it makes you change the viewpoint on the, the challenges actually. Yeah, I mean, obviously it all depends on how much of the plastic is macro versus micro plastic in terms of how easily it's retrievable, I suppose. Yeah, of course. And, and that's probably an issue. Okay, there's another question online. Just audience in the room, please get ready for your questions. Uh, I'm reading out another one uh, online. Uh, Lawrence is asking, I was interested uh, to see an early chart predicting that living standards will increase significantly, but this appears to have been measured as GDP per capita. Is this fair as it does not account for wealth inequality? Um, it's a very good question. Uh, we, I mean, the work I've presented was um, to explain the link between economic growth, uh, so using GDP as a metric, uh, and in that sense, the living standards are really purposely connected to consumption. Like the richer we become, the more we spend, the more we consume. Uh, it doesn't say that living standards means wealth, indeed, and uh, uh, there's, of course, strong connections to 
uh, wealth and uh, equality. Um, we have separate projects to look at some uh, distributional issues of environmental policies and uh, environmental justice. And one thing that's interesting to see is that uh, maybe two things are worth mentioning is that the moment you increase, you address environmental issues, you will gain in wealth because you have better health, a better environment, and generally better uh, living standards in that sense, uh, not just uh, when considering them as linked to consumption. And the other thing is that often addressing environmental issues leads to less inequality because um, people with uh, lower incomes are often uh, relying more on the environment or have a stronger link to the environment. So that's environmental preservation actually also links, uh, well, helps to solve inequality. Thank you for that. Another one online question is, why does non-biodegradable plastic have to be part of the future? Why can't we use just biodegradable plastic in the future? It's an excellent question. Uh, so here there's, maybe two things worth mentioning. One is the role of uh, bio-based plastics, which is not necessarily biodegradable, et cetera, but I think it's still linked. Um, here, it's a bit unclear, the role of scaling up um, the amount of um, bio-based plastics production and its impact on climate change. We have a, a dedicated part of the report I presented initially um, on, on this question. And what we find is that uh, the moment you try and scale up the amount of bio-based plastics, you also end up with using more land and therefore um, cutting forests, which means less carbon sinks and also um, uh, emitting more, for instance, uh, uh, methane and um, uh, those other environmental issues. So it's unfortunately not an easily scalable solution, um, which is why we argue that we should just try and reduce the amount of prices of plastic bottles and single-use plastics rather than try and switch to uh, bio-based plastics. In terms of uh, non-biodegradable plastics, which is not necessarily bio-based, the issue is the scalability in terms of uh, the market production, which doesn't meet the um, the uh, the classical uh, fuel-based uh, plastics yet, but we don't exclude a future base. Like I even just you know hopeful that there will be possibility to scale up. But the moment, even the current technologies, etc., it's not yet envisaged. Okay, and that, and that follows on another question actually in the in the in the chat room. Uh, Charles is asking, what is the correlation between the reduction of plastic packaging? by paper and cardboard. Could a second order impact be more destruction of forests? Uh, it's another very good question, uh, which is why personally I don't uh, look at substitutes so much and I try to uh, use, um, uh, just not use single use uh, packaging at all. Uh, actually, uh, the issue with uh, um, substituting um, single-use plastics with single-use paper and cardboard is a, a big one, and it doesn't just concern the destruction of forests, but also other environmental impacts. Um, for instance, um, there's been lots of life cycle analysis done on specific type of products, and they show that very often substitutes can be worse because plastics you can actually reuse a few times, even for single uh, use products, whereas when it's like cardboard and paper, you can't. And uh, it's often uh, cardboard that it's printed when it substitutes plastics, meaning that um, there's chemicals um, used. So it, it it is a very important uh, question. I'm, I'm I'm smiling because the mobile phone has gone off here in the audience, and everybody's grabbing for their pockets to see whether it was them or not. No, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Is there any question in the room at all that anybody has? No. Uh, I don't think there's any more online either. Uh, I would just like to ask a question, uh, Eliza, is given what you've presented today in terms of the regional and the global action plans that are possible, how positive are you about the future and our ability to preserve the environment? <laughs> um, I think 
we can improve a lot and there have been a lot of environmental issues for which um for which progress has been made for instance on air pollution uh but i think we need uh more uh we need to work a lot more on it and we need more drastic policies um I'm seeing how hard it is to do changes um, such as those taking place in, in Paris in terms of uh, transferring towards biking instead of cars, et cetera. But um, um, I don't know. If you want a, a sincere answer, I think I spent you know, half of my time panicking about the future and half of my time being uh, hopeful when I hear stuff like, uh, the Paris Olympics will be fully circular and there won't be plastics. Uh, you know, there is that wouldn't have been envisaged a few years ago. So maybe there is hope. Okay. And then another follow up question is we, we talked about greenhouse gases, and obviously that's a big concern uh, uh, around the globe. We talked about plastic pollution. Uh, how significant is the problem of air pollution going to be in the future? Um, that's a good question. It's my favorite topic. Uh, so air pollution is one of the topics where you've actually seen more progress over time. So many of the cities have done, have put in place policies so that the air quality is better nowadays than it was in the past. London is a clear example. Paris is one too. Um, so it's, um, it's, uh, it's, you know, there is hope. At the same time, there are several areas of the world that are still very, very far from the uh, guidelines provided by the World Health Organization. And even within OECD countries, uh, there's still, um, most cities still have uh, too high air pollution levels with substantial issues for health for the inhabitants, etc. So it is still a global challenge. It's it has it's far from being solved, but we have the tools to address it. Thank you very much. And just to let everybody know once again, uh, Eliza's slides will be sent out uh, next week uh, with whoever actually attended by online booking will get one or probably Monday or Tuesday. Uh, if there's no more questions in the room and no more questions online, then I think we'll draw things to a conclusion. But uh, can, I please, can you please join me to thank you, Eliza, Eliza, once again for a very interesting talk. Thank you, Eliza.